opportunity to those artists to showcase their work and spread their message. Let me introduce myself. I'm a civil engineer from Damascus, Syria. And I moved to Lebanon with my children a few years ago. I stumbled across uh, those uh, deserted, uh, destroyed stables in the mountains near Beirut. And I decided to restore the place and bring it back to life. It was destroyed during the Lebanese Civil War. It took me one year to finish the project. And May 2012, it was ready to host the Syrian artists displaced or from inside Syria and to give them space to work. Today we have in this exhibition a special group of young emerging Syrian artists and their works created at Art Residence Ali. This place is the space that overcomes politics because young Syrian artists come from different social and religious backgrounds. They share the space, exchange ideas, produce art in an atmosphere of freedom and friendship and solidarity. Until now, I have hosted one month each at a time, 33 artists. They all uh, became one family. They are, we are as close uh, as family to me and to each other. This interactive space has become home away from home. Like in general, in the 20s, it's a promising time, full of possibilities in the future. But for these young artists, in the light of the conflict in Syria, their future is only fear, pain, nostalgia, and sense of being lost. Despite all these odds, as you can see, the Syrian artists are still creating. Raga, can I just ask you, are there a couple of images here, and these are so extraordinary that you would like to just tell us about? Uh, well, I think all the art here is very important to change the misconception of the word about Syria because much of the world knows Syrians as in statistics, just numbers of coffins or refugees. But Syria has another face. My country has lots of talent and creativity. And here at the lobby of the World Bank, just a small glimpse of art of resilience. Please be our witness. Raga Mojini, thank you so much. introduce one of the artists who was fortunate enough to benefit from the extraordinary opportunity that Raghun Mardini is offering at her artist residence there in the mountains of Lebanon. And that's Kabork Murad uh, here. Now, Kabork is a Syrian artist of distinction who combines visual art with music and has been widely exhibited here in the United States. So, Kabork, I'd like you to, please, could you tell us a little bit about your work here and your perspective on what's happening in Syria now? So, I was born in the northeast part of Syria, Kamishli, uh, which is populated mostly Kurdish people. And my grandfather, the Stroubadour, made songs for Kurdish people and I learned Kurdish language from them. So this has all affected me in my works to create works inspired by who is the fabric of Syria. So being Armenian from Syria, it's important for me to thank the country where host us after 1915, when we came after the genocide. And I'll never forget to thank in my works that this is a land where I consider myself home. So in my works, I constantly talk about history. I put uh, centuries old history from Mesopotamia in the work. So if someone sees the work today, they know that we artists from Syria are like any other artists from around the world, we're not uh, in the tents or the drinking water from a uh, uh, river, we're just civilized people and express ourselves like modern and human beings. So that's for me a very important message. And plus, 
uh, what's happening in Syria is important for me to put in my works because I cannot exclude myself just needs red roses and other things. I want to document my day, what's going on there, and I want to support the refugees. I want to support my people the way they supported us when we came to Syria. It's basically, that's uh, what's going on in my works. As we were coming in, Kabul showed me, one of his images is over there. It's the extraordinary black vortex. You can just see it through the corner there. Kabul, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that piece of work and what inspired it. It's a, a try to capture a moment where a group of uh, people are falling and you can see they're wrapped in, in fabric. The textile is uh, symbolic elements of history for me. They're all on the ground, they're all dying with the swords and you can see Arabian horse on the side also dying. But you see only one person standing and screaming. The name of the piece is The Last Voice. It's resembles a person, if we have one person survives, in that image, it means we can recreate the history. So we're there to stand. No one can just erase us. What impact do you think the images of the conflict are having on, on shaping opinion outside Syria? It's actually the basic thing to express. If you're an artist, uh, like I said my English is not that eloquent to, to speak, but when you create a word, it's easier. It's like music. It's very universal. When you look at it, you can be with me in the moment I was feeling what's going on in my home. So if one image can give more information, then maybe. Well, Brian, thank you so much. That's so interesting to hear your perspective on all of it. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Chris Gunnis. Now, Chris is actually an old colleague from the BBC. Uh, we both were United Nations correspondents and uh, when I was covering the UN, which was some years after Chris, he was notorious for being the hardest working UN correspondent there had ever been. <laughs> So I tried to live up to that, but Chris is now, as you all know, he's the spokesperson for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, uh, and he's done a ton of advocacy uh, around this conflict. So Chris, why do you think images have become so important here? It's very clear to me, and one of the reasons I wanted to come and be at this amazing event, that words simply, as T.S. Eliot, one of the great wordsmiths of the 20th century said, words crack and break under the burden of meaning. So when you hear that 9.3 million people have been displaced, when you hear that five million children need some form of humanitarian assistance, when you read in the papers that Lebanon has just taken in its one millionth refugee, what does that actually mean? Because to me, as someone who's throughout their career used words, it feels like a shopping list. You know, you read the latest World Bank report, you read you know, the latest report from an NGO, it simply becomes another series of words. I feel a profound sense of moral outrage, which words cannot express, but I think images can. I feel a profound sense of moral outrage because in the capital city of a UN member state, in the 21st century, we have an image like that one over there. I don't know if you can see it in the front, but behind, between the blue and the orange cones, we see an image which is both cinematic and epic, and something out of the great epic poems through the ages, the epic of Gilgamesh, the story of the Exodus, the Kalevala, the Finnish epic, the saga of Harold, goodness knows what. So many people have written to me and said, this image represents something like a primordial founding myth of our own nation. And I think the reason why it became an iconic Tell image. Tell us about that image, Chris, and just exactly what it's on. 31st of January, we went in, UNRWA feeds 18,000 Palestinians and about 2,000 ordinary civilians in what was once the thriving, bustling heart of the Palestinian community in Syria. It's a refugee camp called, called Yadmuk. And in December um, 2012, armed groups moved into the camp. The Syrian government responded by bombarding it. And by Ju July last year, a, a, a blockade effectively had been imposed. We now have reports of women dying in childbirth for lack of medical care of widespread incidents of children, infants, babies with malnutrition. And what you see there is people who are besieged, mainly Palestinians, queuing up for UNRWA food distributions.
And Chris, tell us about what you did with that image and how you were able to use it for your advocacy. Well, the image quite simply has a wow well factor. When I saw it, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up because it is such a powerful image. I released it to journalists and within a few hours it had been reproduced eight million times on the internet and the next day it appeared in nearly a thousand newspapers around the world. It was the basis of a social media campaign which was supported by 30 celebrities including people like Alfonso Cuaron who won the Oscar for Best Actor, Emma Thompson, uh, Sting, Peter Gabriel, Annie Lennox. Um, it was quite simple. People who clicked as part of the campaign were able, if they, if 23 million people clicked, which is the pre-war population of Syria, the campaign was to get 23 million people clicking on that image. And when we got to 23 million, it went up on the iconic um, billboard, the world famous billboard known as the Jumbotron in Times Square. And that's precisely what happened. There was then a spontaneous flash mob event whereby hundreds of people went and rather like a candlelight vigil, they held up pizza bread to the starving people of Yarmouk. We then took photographs and tweeted them back into Yarmouk. So there was a great sense, I think, of solidarity, of this global solidarity with the people. Because I think there's one important point to make, and that is that 38 million people in the end supported the campaign. I think there is a profound sense of revulsion in the world that the Security Council has been unable to do very much for those people, that institutions like the World Bank, like UNRWA for which I work, risk becoming irrelevant because in the face of such profound um, and desperate humanitarian suffering that that iconic image symbolizes, we're all fairly powerless. We, for example, in UNRWA, have delivered about 11,000 food parcels since the 18th of January to 20,000 people. There are plenty of economists here, they can do the math. It's not enough, and we have to do more. But the imagery is, is something that motivates people, I think, more than anything I can ever say. Could it be our